Today on the show, I'm happy to have Charlie Van Derven. He's the president of Social Advisors, your business development partner in financial services. So before this, you had a job and you were fired. I live in Florida. I was working for a company out of San Diego. I had maybe a decade and a half of experience in marketing and financial services prior to this, but I landed with this company, Chad. I had some strategic vision for my relationship with them. They were on one coast, I was on the other. And let's just say things didn't work out as well as they could have. And so that's the only job other than a landscaping job in high school. And I think back on it, but that's because I was being stupid. That's the only job I ever was fired from. And something needed to happen. And yeah, so we had a, my wife and I had a meager savings. I said, baby, I need 60 days. Give me 60 days. I can prop this thing up. And here we are 10 years later and best decision we ever made. Did it actually happen in 60 days? I got, so my dad, my dad loves to tell the story. My parents were visiting. They, I grew up in Wisconsin. They, my, my mom's no longer with us, but my dad still lives up in Wisconsin. They were visiting, I think it was day 42, we got our first client. And he loves to tell the story of me walking out of, we got, it's, a, it's a funny story. We had a three bedroom house. We cleared all the furniture out of the master bedroom, moved in a conference table, first day of the business propped open the laptop and set the cell phone next to me and uh, built our website, built our logo. It was just like the infancy of it. So anyway, my parents are visiting day 42. We got our first contract and our first credit card number. And I bust out of the master bedroom celebrating this thing. And my dad loves to tell that story of how just he was there at the ground level of all this. So anyways, you know, fun to reminisce about it. And here we are 10 years later, man. It's crazy to think that. So what was the service thing, service offer? being then versus what it is now. I'll tell you what, Chad, first off, I propped up the business. The company I was working for was a a website. Let me call them a content distribution company. One of the, one of the subtleties about financial services, which is cool if you know how to navigate it is, is it's a highly compliant environment for most advisors. You've got FINRA regulations for other advisors, you've got SEC regulations. So in, in marketing, everything's got to be reviewed. Everything's got to be approved. Everything's got the company I was working for had a library of pre-approved content that they would distribute across websites, social media, and newsletter. Great concept. Problem is that stuff isn't built for advisors, right? That stuff is built for the regulators, just so the regulators feel good about it. I never really saw people have success. And today the company's still around and I probably got 60 or 70,000 clients all sharing the same 200 pieces of content. And again, it's not great for the, that's not great for the advisors. I believed I could put a personal touch to the same types of strategies. And, and so we really aren't all that different today, 10 years later than we were. First day it was, we do social media for financial advisors. And I really wasn't sure what that meant. And we got away from that for a couple of years because it was self-funded. And so the neighbor would say, Hey, I got a bar. Can you help me with social media? I'd be like, oh yeah, I can help you. So you got two nickels. Yeah, I can help you. So that's how it went. But LinkedIn's a much more significant piece of what we do today. I would say probably like Facebook is less, less important to what we do today. Instagram is rapidly becoming way more important to what we do today. So the platforms come and go and change and evolve, but we're a content company, right? We're helping advisors tell their story, get their word out, hone their brand, understand who they, understand who they best work with, understand the specific value they provide those people. Webinars are a big part of it today. They weren't so much back in the, in the early time. So it's evolved, but man, it's stayed pretty core over the last decade. So what does a piece of content look like for a financial advisor? I'm assuming it's not like dancing cats. You'd be amazed. Actually, if you put some dancing cats on LinkedIn, it'd probably get better exposure than some of the four, four tips about this are LinkedIn is starved for entertaining content, right? It's all people giving advice on stuff. And sometimes that doesn't feel great. So maybe a dancing cat might actually, it's, if you say, if you put a post up about celebrating someone's birthday in your firm. Dude, that goes, you might get four times the exposure of here's four ways to avoid ruining your retirement. So when you get like LinkedIn misses the social post, the, the social component, LinkedIn's all a bunch of salespeople shouting sales things at each other. And, and that's okay. It's an easy way to meet people, but they're starved for like accomplishments and celebrations and organizations that are supported. When a, so we do a lot of we do a lot of thought leadership content, and that's based on articles that we ghostwrite for advisors and social posts that goes with those that go with those articles. But the stuff that reaches the most people is the I want to call up my assistant for this great thing that they did last month. That's the stuff that really that really turns heads and gets a lot of exposure. So, so that's really interesting because yeah. on other platforms, 
There's too much of that. Yeah. I don't want to go as far as here's a, my, here's a picture of my dinner. We don't want to go that deep, but the, the celebrating of other people and also the ability to tag somebody or this, our firm, XYZ firm supports a United Way of Cleveland or whatever that might be. The ability to demonstrate who you are as a human versus who you are as a professional. And of course, there's a lot of crossover there, but, and to be able to tag a large organization like the United Way in this example, that creates a lot of exposure for the advisor's content. Keeping a business alive for yeah. Yeah. over a decade. Yeah, man. <laughs> That's an accomplishment in itself. Yeah. So what have been, I'm sure there's a couple of moments where you were like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow to keep this thing afloat. I've been involved in some development projects over the years, and one was pretty successful and two or three were not. And the, here's the beauty of social advisors. It's pretty simple, right? I hate to give away the secret sauce, but it's not like I'm hiding anything. We're really a software company, right? So if we can white label software and we can do it in a compliant way that, that makes a difference for our industry, we will. The LinkedIn strategies you run, you can log into a dashboard that's got our logo all over it and it's branded in our colors. It's not our, it's not our technology. I've got, a, I've got an extensive marketing background. I've got an extensive sales background. So those things certainly help hone our messaging and provide kind of consultative value to our clients. But the tools that we use to run our strategies, they aren't even our tools, right? So it makes our business, now we're giving up margin by someone else housing those tools, but we remove a lot of risk. So even in lean times, we can scale back or scale up really pretty easily. Right. And we can evolve very quickly. I'll share with you for four or five years, we were on a specific platform that allowed us to automate some LinkedIn. So I hope, hope LinkedIn's not listening, but it allowed us to, and of course, they know a lot of that stuff's going on, but we were on a platform and frankly, they didn't keep up with their hardware and they didn't keep up with their software. And they were great for four years, but we needed to make a change and we could make that change took 30 days and we were our clients got better tools, more advanced tools. So they saw it as a huge advancement for the company. And in 30 days, we pivoted. And we could do that because it wasn't our software. If I was the guy who created that software, I'd have to keep selling a piece of crap. I love that relationship. And those guys are revamping what they're doing. And when, they're, and when their tools are better, there's a likelihood we go back to them because I love working with those guys. I still love those guys. We, we had a great relationship for four or five years. We talk every couple of weeks. And when their tools exceed the tool we're using, we can pivot back and it's going to be, it's a fairly simple move to make. You've structured yourself in a way where you're the front end and you specialize in the strategy part of what you do. And then everybody else is plug and play, essentially. Yep. You got it. Yeah. We've got a very specific four-step strategy. It works. It's time tested. It's proven. We, we license the technology. We white label the technology to run those four steps. There's plenty of technology providers in every one of, in every segment. But yeah, to your point, we, we market ourselves, we sell our services, and we service the hell out of clients. We let somebody else worry about the software. So what are your four steps? We can create a conventional. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, listen, and I'll tell you, Chad, it's, I, don't I don't think it's revolutionary. I don't think it's any different than it was in 1965, right, or 1995. Um, you got to understand, no matter what you're selling, and we're all selling something to some degree, you've got to understand who you're selling to. You got pods that drive revenue. You're selling to, you're selling to people that have podcasts. That's it. We sell to B2B even more narrow than that. We sell to financial services even more narrow than that. We sell to independent financial advisors, right? So the beauty of that is we can speak to the value we create for that specific audience. We remove a lot of our competition. There's a hell of a lot of agencies out there, though a lot of them are doing heavy design work and websites and stuff. We don't do that sort of thing. So. Understanding who you sell to removes your competition and allows you to understand really specifically the value you create for that audience. Number two is you've got to get in front of people every single day, right? You and I met on LinkedIn, so I know you're using that tool well in a business to business capacity. You could be doing, you could be doing a meetup where you're located and meeting podcast hosts where you're located. So you could do local networking. You could join professional associations. LinkedIn's a great tool for advisors and, and guys like yourself for growing that network. Step two is you got to grow that audience every single day. You got to have people to talk to, right? The beauty of the technology tools we have, the advanced CRMs and such, 
Good. You can nurture 10,000 relationships like you can 10. You can, you got the tools in place to measure who's paying attention and everything else. Number three is you've got to nurture. You've got to be doing content marketing, intelligent content marketing. You've got to be doing email marketing. You've got to nurture relationships. You've got to engage daily. You got to, and that's step three is you got to be able to at least build your brand and build trust in who you are as an individual. And step four, you got to be able to convert. So if you're nurturing 10,000 people, how do you know who's ready for a deeper conversation? I know two ways, right? There's sophisticated CRM tools out there that'll do lead scoring. So if someone watches your video, opens your emails, checks out your website, reads your article, blah, 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 it scores them so you can see that. Absent of that sophistication, do webinars. Like run webinars, man. LinkedIn events makes it so easy to invite people to your webinars. You can invite 2,000 people over two weeks. You got 40 people that show up. That's your pipeline, right? Especially given who we serve, people engage advisors when they hit a significant milestone in their life. They have a baby, they buy their first house, they sell a business, they get an inheritance, they get a settlement from something legal related. That's when they engage an advisor. So if you're talking to 10,000 people, they're going through these milestone events at different paces. And you need to know when they just have a baby, run a, run a webinar on maybe life insurance or who's got a kid that's going to go to college soon, run a webinar on five to nine plans. And those people that show up, they are raising their hand. They are ready for a deeper conversation and they trust you. That's why they're taking the information from you. That's it. Know your audience, network daily, nurture that audience, build trust and want run webinars to convert. Did you start targeting financial advisors from day one? I did. I, I was an early snowboard. I don't even see it, but I got a couple old relic snowboards hanging on the wall back there. I was, I, so I was a rep in that industry when I was like in my, you know, mid twenties. And, uh, anyway, without going into too much detail, that, that situation didn't work out so well. And in 1998, I found a, a little technology company. I was living in Duluth, Minnesota, running a sales territory, found a little technology company out of the newspaper. And they were launching websites in five verticals and financial services was one of those five. I think I was employee 11 or 12. That company called 50 Below is now part of a big firm in the industry called Broadridge. Yeah. So I, I got involved in, in financial services just because I found this job in downtown Duluth, Minnesota, and they were serving that industry. And it's hard to look back on it now. You're actually, we're talking on my 51st birthday. So it's, it's interesting to look back and understand that's 25 years ago already. And I shake my head a little bit. That's crazy. But yeah, it's like, I just fell ass backward into financial services. It wasn't like a passion of mine, but it's people that need service. I'll tell you what, it's a well-organized industry. It's an affluent industry. They don't send, they don't spend enough money on marketing. That's so it's, it's, I've got a lot of knowledge there. I've got a lot of friends there. I think they're doing good things for people as well. They're helping people with setting, handling devastating things in families getting them set up for good, for good future after working, making sure kids are going to college. They're doing a lot of really good things for American families. So if one of the uh, financial advisors in our audience wanted to get in touch with you for your services, how could they do? Yeah, I'm about, the, I think I'm the only Charlie Van Durven in the world, I think. So I'm easy to find. I like LinkedIn, but also probably LinkedIn's the easiest way, but I'm, I'm cool with cell phone too. Phone number 386-846. 5291 and our website and all the inquiries from the website still come to me. We got to be ba based on the efficiencies of technology. We can run things on a pretty small team. So we're a team of seven right now. We've been as big as 13, but honestly with AI and stuff, doing what we do becomes easier and easier. So if you go to social-advisors.com, if you fill out an inquiry there, it goes right to me. So thank you, Charlie, for coming on the show and everybody for listening to another episode nice. of Failing to Success. Make sure to smash that subscribe button. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki, and we'll see you next time.